Good morning, Tucson. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tom Red. I'm from SAP, and we're very, very involved, of course, as you all know, in that area of the retail technology side. What you also may not know is we're also very stylish people. I'm actually wearing my suit, which is from Macy's. Of course, I've got the Hugo Boss jacket. I've got the Mark New York tie. And of course, other parts that I just don't want to discuss. But you know, quite a good looking suit. All provided by Macy's. And of course, with a discount because there was too much supply in that store of this very popular suit. <laughs> Is that what I was supposed to say, Terry? Thank you. All right, good. We want to sell, we want to sell some product. So, uh, Folks, today we have a really great opportunity. We are going to be actually taking some time to do some studying. So especially for the students in back, I want you to kind of clear off the space in front of you or actually flip your iPad to a clean notes page. So let's, you know, go ahead and use our iPads. What we're gonna do is today we're gonna talk about economics. That's right, good topic. I didn't sleep through it in college. Maybe I did a couple times. We're gonna talk elasticity. Inelasticity. I mean, these are some exciting areas. What's it mean when that price is inelastic? Isn't that going to be exciting? We're going to talk about some of the areas that I can't stand, but you know what? They're important. I mean, we're talking purchase power parity. This is an exciting topic you can take home and share with your children. So this is really exciting stuff. But you know what? Before I introduce our speaker, which you've already seen his picture. You go, if you ever go to Google and just type in Ira Kalish, you'll get all types of replies. Most of them you won't understand because some of the topsy topics he talks about can be complex. But the one thing he's great at is when he talks to us about what's going on, what's happening out in that real world, he can talk about it in a way that you'll go home wanting to be an economic so bad. You'll actually think about switching jobs. <clears throat> and by the way, Macy's. So, um, I'm going to talk today about uh, the economy, as you know. Unfortunately, Terry is a tough act to follow because I don't have a video that shows Justin Bieber or Rihanna. Uh, but hopefully what I have to say will interest you nonetheless. Uh, I'm going to talk about the U.S. economy and a little bit about Europe and China and Japan, very important economies, and hopefully talk about how the economy is having a big impact on consumers and what we can expect going forward. So first, to start with the U.S. economy, we've heard a lot of bad things. Uh, we've seen that economic growth has been very disappointing, that unemployment remains very high. And while this is true, I'd like to offer a slightly different perspective on the U.S. economy, which is that it's done surprisingly well. Uh, and if you look at this chart, and I do have a lot of charts, and I apologize for that, um, if you look at this chart, it shows the trajectory of our economy, of real GDP, compared to other major developed economies, such as the Eurozone, the UK, and Japan. And interestingly, we've done better than anyone else. If you look at it, we had a more shallow recession and a more robust recovery than any other part of the world. <clears throat> and compared to these others, we're the only ones that have seen our economy grow to be bigger than it was prior to the recession. And this reflects the fact that we've had a very aggressive monetary policy on the part of the Federal Reserve. We've had a very modest fiscal contraction. We've had tax increases and spending cuts, but not nearly as much as some other countries have done. Uh, and so in a sense, our political dysfunction has served us well in that we haven't cut our budget deficit as fast as some people want. And of course, that's not to say that we shouldn't cut it in the long run. It's just that in the short run, that's actually been a pretty good thing. And of course, our population grows faster than most other places. We have a higher birth rate. We have more immigration. So that's another reason why our economy has done well. Now, the danger to our economy comes from policymakers, of course. And <clears throat> the good thing is that we averted the fiscal cliff, so that's out of the way. And we continue to have budget negotiations between these two guys who are not necessarily the best friends. Uh, we did get the sequestration, which is automatic cuts in spending. And that, combined with the payroll tax, is already having some negative impact on economic growth and will continue to have a negative impact. But my story today is that despite that, we're actually going to do reasonably well. We have a number of other positive things going on 
that are offsetting the negative things in terms of fiscal policy. Um, and despite the fact that we continue to have a very large budget deficit, we have historically low interest rates, which is a bit of a surprise because historically, one of the reasons we worry about budget deficits is that when the government is borrowing money in competition with the private sector, that tends to push up interest rates and stifle investment and slow economic growth. That's not the case today. We have big deficits, but we have low interest rates, and that's a good thing. The question is why? Why are interest rates low, and why are they likely to remain low? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve has kept short-term rates very low, and they've been buying long-term bonds, which help to keep long-term rates low. Um, and the, despite the fact that we have a big fiscal deficit on the part of the federal government, that's been offset by massive private savings. The private sector is running a big surplus. They're hoarding cash, and they're happy to put that cash in government bonds, which are relatively safe, as well as foreigners. They're happy to buy U.S. government bonds because regardless of how worrisome they may be, they're not nearly as worrisome as buying, say, Italian government bonds. So, um, <laughs> so for that reason, U.S. interest rates are relatively low. And finally, interest rates are governed to some extent by expectations of inflation. And right now, inflation is low, and many analysts, including me, expect inflation to remain low. And that raises the question, why are we going to continue to have low inflation? Because this is something a lot of people are worried about. And one reason they're worried about it is that the Federal Reserve has been buying assets. It's increased uh, the value of its balance sheet dramatically. And so you hear a lot in the press about how the Fed is printing money with abandon. This is not actually the case. They're not actually printing money. They're buying assets, but they're doing it to offset the fact that banks are hoarding cash, in which case that leads to a drop in the money supply. So they're keeping the money supply growing, but not at a, at a horrendous rate. And if it does start to rise rapidly, the Fed can undo what they've done. So there's really no risk from what the Fed is doing in terms of, of inflation. Meanwhile, we have massive unemployment still, so there's no reason why wages should start to accelerate, and they haven't. We have a relatively weak global economy, and the financial markets are still expecting low inflation, and that's what's keeping inflation low. So from a retail perspective, we're not going to see anytime soon the kind of high inflation that leads to boosting of profit margins. This is going to be, I think, in the next few years, a very low inflation environment, even if commodity prices start to rise. So let's talk about some of the positive signs. I think that despite what's going on in Washington, despite tax increases and spending cuts, the economy is going to do reasonably well. Why? Well, one positive sign is that the job market is looking pretty good. Despite the fact that last Friday we saw a pretty bad employment report for March, I think that might have been a blip. It's too early to say, but there are too many other positive factors in the job market right now, including the fact that this morning the government issued its um, weekly numbers for new unemployment claims and they were way down. So the job market is looking pretty good and we've seen a big drop in new claims for unemployment insurance. It's been a bumpy ride, but the general trend is good. And one of the interesting things is that the uh, H-1B visas for skilled workers, this year the, the, there was a sort of like an auction for them uh, or a lottery, and the quota for those visas was um, used up in just five days. Last year, it took 10 weeks to use them up. That's a sign of strength in the job market, particularly strength in the job market for skilled people, which is certainly good for all the students here. Um, another positive thing is that we continue to see gains in real income. Wages are rising modestly. There's almost no inflation, so that translates into real gains in income. And while it's not gangbusters, it's pretty good. The December number in 2012 was a blip. That was due to the fact that people were expecting a tax increase in January. And so they took bonuses and capital gains and uh, dividends in December to avoid higher taxes. And that's why we got that blip there. But the general trend is pretty good. And so consumer incomes continue to rise. And then, of course, there's the housing market, which was the source of all the trouble we had four years ago. Uh, and you can see housing starts dropped precipitously, stayed down for a very long time, much longer than usual. Usually, when we have economic recoveries, housing bounces back pretty quickly. That certainly wasn't the case this time. But now, we're starting to see a bit of a bounce. 
not nearly what we would like and not nearly what we've had in the past, and we may never get back to where we were in the past, but the trajectory is good. In fact, in 2012, we saw pretty strong growth in the housing market. That reflected the fact that we have very low interest rates, which has made housing more affordable. Uh, prices now in the housing market are starting to rise. That's helping more people get out from underwater. Um, and then, of course, there's the risk that banks will release more foreclosed properties, but as long as they're not doing that, that keeps the supply short, keeps prices rising, keeps activity in the housing market going, and that's obviously a good thing for employment and a good thing for retail. And that partly reflects the fact that there has been an improvement in credit market conditions, particularly in the non-mortgage side. If you look at this, this is the delinquency rate on consumer loans, not mortgage loans, but credit card and auto loans, it's way down. It's lower than it was back in 2006. That means banks have cleaned up their balance sheets. They're now much more willing to lend to consumers. Consumers are more willing to borrow. And the end result is that we've seen pretty good spending, particularly on automobiles. This is light vehicle sales, cars and trucks, way up from the bottom that we reached four years ago. That reflects very low interest rates, better credit market conditions, better ability on the part of consumers to borrow, and we've seen pretty good or moderate gains in retail spending as well. And the question is, what's driving the consumer? Why in this relatively difficult business environment where unemployment remains still very, very high, why are consumers out there spending? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. One is that their cash flow is a lot better. They've paid down debts. If you look at this chart, it shows debt service payments as a share of disposable income. That's way down to a level we haven't seen in 20 years. The volume of credit card debt is lower than it's been in 10 years. So because of that, consumers have better cash flow. They also have better balance sheets. Equity prices have risen, house prices have risen, consumers have less debt, so they're feeling wealthier. That also makes them more willing to spend. As I mentioned, we're seeing more job growth, more income growth, greater access to credit. All of these things are offsetting the fact that we did have an increase in the payroll tax. There was a lot of fear when the payroll tax went up in January that it would have a big dampening effect on consumer spending. It didn't. It did have an effect on consumer confidence because through all the public uh, discussion about the fiscal cliff, it was all about raising taxes on upper income households. There was very little discussion about the fact that payroll taxes would rise. So when people opened their paychecks in January and saw that the payroll tax increased, they were horrified, and co confidence actually dropped a lot, but not enough to get people to stop spending. They continue to spend for all of these reasons that I discussed, and I think they will continue to spend throughout this year unless we see some external shock uh, that has a negative impact on the consumer. Of course, there are continued risks to the economy. One is the fact that banks still have a lot of bad debt on their, on their books. This is the delinquency rate on single-family mortgages. It hasn't come down. It's still very high. And this reflects the fact that banks now have a lot of bad debt. They still have a lot of foreclosed properties. They haven't released on the market. So when it comes to the mortgage market, although it's improving, there's still some restrictiveness in terms of credit market conditions. That's having a, a negative effect on the economy. We also have very long-term unemployment, which is a big problem. This chart shows the number of people who've been unemployed for more than six months. And this goes back to 1950. And by the way, some of my charts on the bottom left-hand side say FRED. That's Federal Reserve Economic Database. It's not something funny. So um, in any event, what you see is the uh, sh shaded areas, the gray shaded areas are recessions. And so you can see during each recession, we get a little blip in terms of long-term unemployment, and then it comes down. In this most recent recession, you see something totally different. Long-term unemployment went way, way up. It's come down a little, but it's still very, very high. This reflects the fact that we're seeing a changing structure of our economy. In the past, when we had recessions, it often entailed factories temporarily laying off workers, and then when demand started to pick up, those factories would rehire those same workers to the same jobs, employment would grow, unemployment came down, everything was fine. That's not the way the world works anymore. Now, we saw a lot of jobs destroyed. A lot of the job growth we saw in the past decade prior to the recession was in construction or real estate or financial services. Those jobs are gone and are not coming back. And so those people are having difficulty finding jobs. 
If you were a construction worker, there aren't construction jobs now. Now there are jobs in healthcare or professional services, but those construction workers don't have the skills to work in the healthcare field. Hence, very high structural unemployment. Now, of course, there's been a huge increase in the number of people going back to school, trying to get the skills they need for a new economy. But it takes a long time to work that through. And this is one of the things that's holding back job growth, holding back economic growth. And it's something that we're going to have to focus on. There are, of course, other risks to the economy. There is the risk that we'll see more tax increases and spending cuts. President Obama yesterday released his budget, which called for both. And I think, to his credit, he was criticized by both Republicans and Democrats, which means that maybe he's on to something. Uh, but in any event, other risks include the fact that financial markets might one day wake up and get worried about the fact that US government debt is rising at an unsustainable level. And maybe they will boost uh, bond yields and interest rates will go up. But I don't think that's likely to happen anytime soon. We do have the issue of foreclosed properties. There is the uncertain impact of Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. It's now starting to get implemented. We really don't know how this will play out in terms of its economic impact. The devil is often in the details, and we'll just have to wait and see. And then there's the rest of the world. That's often a big risk. North Korea, Iran, the Eurozone, lots of issues out there that could have a negative or positive impact on the global economy and on the US economy. Another. <clears throat> so, well, before we get to another issue, um, so what's the likely outcome? What, what are we going to see in terms of the U.S. economy? Um, I think this year we'll see better growth than we did last year, despite the fact that we have these fiscal issues. I think we'll see a little bit better growth, and then longer term, growth will pick up and get back to a normal level. The difference, though, is that we're not going to see the kind of growth we saw in the past. In the past decade, prior to the recession, most of our growth came from the consumer or from housing. It's going to be different going forward. And here's why. If you look at this chart, it shows what went on the past decade. The blue line shows the cash that Americans extracted from their homes when they took out home equity loans or refinanced their mortgages. That's the extra cash they got out from the increased value from their homes. The green line shows the increase in consumer spending each year. As you'll notice, for most of these years, the two lines are nearly identical. In other words, for that decade, nearly all of the increase in consumer spending was funded by the cash people got out of their homes as their homes were rising in value. And now their homes have dropped in value. And now they can't get cash out of their homes anymore. So this is not going to happen again anytime soon. Going forward, we're going to see consumer spending drop as a share of GDP back down to a more normal level. It really rose too high in the past decade, which means that consumer spending will grow more slowly than the overall economy. And more of our growth will come from exports and business investment. So from a retail perspective, that's not necessarily the best news, but it means that if you're a good retailer, you're a good retailer. You're not just simply going to be a good retailer on the back of a strong, growing consumer sector. You're going to be a good retailer by gaining market share at the expense of other retailers. And that, of course, is a challenge. But when it's done well, it's exhilarating. So this is the new type of environment that we're going to see. There are a couple of longer term issues. One is the labor market. I talked about structural unemployment. Part of it has to do with a skills mismatch. If you look at this chart, the red line shows the number of people in the US economy who are employed who have a college degree or above. The blue line shows the number of people employed who have a high school diploma but have not gone to college. They started out in 2000, the same number of people. But over the past decade, the number of college graduates who ha have jobs has increased. The number of high school graduates who have jobs has decreased. And that reflects the changing structure of our economy. Because of globalization, because of information technology, our economy is requiring more skills and education. We're demanding more people for jobs that require those skills and fewer people who don't have skills. And so that's what's happening. And yet, we're not producing enough people with skills. We're not importing enough people with skills. So there's a shortage, in a sense, of skilled workers. And that's leading to wage gains for people with high levels of skill and wage stagnation for everyone else. And that's one of the things leading to income disparity, more rich, more poor, fewer people in between. And that, obviously, is having an impact on retailing, what types of retailers do well and don't do well. 
So this is the world in which we live, and this is not likely to change anytime soon. Another long-term issue is that we're getting older. This chart shows the number of six people above 65 relative to the number of working age people. It's about to rise precipitously over the next 20 years. That's a fact. It's going to have a big impact on government, will have a big impact on retailing, uh, and particularly when it comes to government, it's a big issue because it means Medicare and Social Security are going to grow just simply because of demographics. That's really the main reason we're looking at future big budget deficits. And the way you deal with that is you do one or more of these things. You either raise taxes, which no one wants to do. You cut benefits. In fact, part of Obama's plan yesterday was to slightly cut the growth of Social Security, and all hell broke loose when he suggested that. Um, another thing you could do is further raise the retirement age. So that shifts the ratio of workers to retirees. You can engage in means testing of entitlement programs, that is, require upper income people to pay for more of their health care rather than rely on Medicare. Or you could allow more immigration, because most immigrants are young, and that raises the ratio of workers to retirees and makes it more feasible to pay for entitlement programs. Which brings us to another long-term issue, which is immigration. And we hear a lot of discussion in Washington about that. Most of the discussion is about border security or securing uh, citizenship for the, those who are here illegally. And those are important issues. But to me, they're not the main issue. The main issue is the effect that immigration has on the economy. It affects age distribution. Makes it, if you have more immigration, it makes it easier to pay for entitlement programs for the elderly. It affects income distribution, certainly. It affects innovation. When you bring in skilled workers to places like Silicon Valley, they are more likely to start businesses than people who were already here. That's just a fact, historically and currently. And so that affects innovation. That affects entrepreneurship. It affects job creation. And ultimately, it affects economic growth. So my argument is we're better off if we allow more immigration, particularly skilled immigration. But most of the debate about immigration is not really about that. And then finally, a very interesting long-term issue is energy. Uh, we're seeing a game changer here in this, in this country right now because of a huge increase in uh, production of natural gas and oil because of this picture, which is how uh, horizontal uh, hydraulic fracking takes place. I don't really understand how it takes place, but this picture kind of explains it. And what they do is they shoot water and chemicals at very high speed into rocks very deep underground, releasing gas, capturing the gas, and selling the gas and using the gas. And we're seeing a huge increase in production of natural gas in the United States, and this will continue in the years to come. It will have a big impact. It changes geopolitics. It changes the role of the Middle East, for example, because the US will soon become energy independent because of this. It means less inflation because we're getting access to cheaper energy. It means an improved trade balance because we're importing less oil. It boosts our competitiveness because our manufacturers that are energy intensive are using cheaper energy than our competitors in other parts of the world. So that's contributing to the revival of Amer American manufacturing. And ultimately, it's increasing economic growth. Already, a lot of the investment in this technology is boosting economic growth. So this is a big game changer, and it's a very positive thing overall. This is interesting. Um, this shows the number of my, an index of the number of miles driven per person in the United States. Now, you can see over a long period of time, we've been driving more. And every time we have recessions, because people are unemployed, we drive a little bit less, and then it continues to grow. But since 2005, we've had a steady decline in the number of miles we're driving. We have never seen this before since the car. This is something entirely new and has vast implications, especially for retailers. Why is this happening? Why are people driving less? Well, there are a number of reasons. One is the aging population. Older people don't work, so they don't go out to a job every day, of course. Uh, but it's technology. It's the internet. People are shopping at home. People are working at home. This is having a big impact on how much people go places. Also, to a certain extent, people are taking more public transit. And as a result, fewer people are owning cars, or people are owning fewer cars. And then, of course, there's the issue of the long-term unemployed. This chart shows the blue line is the ratio of employment to population. It has dropped precipitously 
uh, because of this big long-term unemployment that we're having. And the red line is the unemployment rate. So that obviously is having a negative impact on driving. But overall, though, beyond the economic impact, we're seeing the impact of the internet on driving and obviously on where people shop and how people shop. And this is very important from a retail perspective. Let me turn to the rest of the world. First, Europe, uh, where a recession continues. You can see retail sales are really bad. Industrial production is bad. And it's sort of a perfect storm of bad things. Uh, we have fiscal tightening. We have troubled credit markets in Europe. We have a perceived currency risk because people are worried that the euro won't survive. And because of all of that, there's low business confidence in Europe. And so Europe is in a bad recession right now. The good news is that the European Central Bank announced about eight months ago that they will provide unlimited lending to sovereign debtors who get into trouble. So that provided kind of a credible backstop and led to a drop in bond yields and made it easier for countries like Spain and Italy to service their debts. Moreover, it led to a number of other good things. Risk spreads came down. There was a reversal of capital flight. Money started to come back into places like Italy and Spain. Bank deposits stabilized. Business confidence got better. And competitiveness improved as well. And the exports from these countries are doing reasonably well, even though nothing else is going well. But despite all these positive things, credit markets still continue to be very tight. Banks are being forced to recapitalize on their own. They're cutting back on lending. They're selling assets. So we're not seeing any private sector credit growth in Europe. And in troubled countries like Italy and Spain and Greece and Portugal, we're seeing a decline in credit market activity and a continued decline in economic activity. And that's a very bad thing. So where do we go from here? Well, there are a number of challenges. And one is this gentleman here. Uh, you may not know who he is. His name is uh, Beppe Grio. He's a professional comedian in Italy. And in the recent election in Italy, he got 25% of the vote. <laughs> this is no joke. He's a, literally a comedian. This would be as if Jon Stewart controlled 25% of the seats in the House of Representatives. Well, on second thought, that might not be a bad thing. But, <laughs> but, um, or Chris Rock, or, or whomever your favorite comedian is. But in any event, this is a reflection of the uh, dysfunctionality of Italian politics. And it means that there's some political risk in Europe and some risk that Italy will not continue on the path of economic reform that they need to do in order to get back in shape, in order to have access to global credit markets. So that's just one example of some of the bad things going on in Europe. France is in recession. Italy has its bad elections. Spain has really dysfunctional politics, too, uh, including an effort on the part of Catalonia, which is the area around Barcelona, to secede from Spain and become a separate country. Uh, so that's one more headache that is affecting the stability of Europe. Greece, obviously, is a big issue. And Cyprus has banks that have failed. And now uh, the depositors had to take a haircut in order to rescue these banks and rescue the Cypriot economy. Um, and part of it had to do with the fact that a lot of the deposits, more than half the deposits in Cyprus's banks, came from Russian billionaires who were hiding money outside of Russia. So it's a very complicated world we live in. But in any event, Europe is in a mess, basically. Now let me turn to a, a faster growing part of the world, which is China. Uh, China did experience a slowdown last year. Uh, their economy grew only 7.8% which was the slowest rate of growth since 1999. Now, we would love to have 7.8% growth here, but by Chinese standards, that was slow. And the slowdown appears to be over. They engaged in some stimulus. They loosened their monetary policy. So we're starting to see a little bit faster growth in China this year. But longer term, China has some serious challenges. One challenge is actually a labor shortage. Last year, for the first time ever, the labor force in China declined in size. And this reflected the lagged effect of their one-child policy. And this labor shortage led to a very rapid increase in wages, which means that the low-wage production that China became famous for is no longer economically feasible in China. And so we're seeing a lot of low-wage jobs leave China and go to places like Vietnam, Indonesia, and even Latin America. There are Chinese companies that are opening factories in Mexico and Brazil because the wage gap between those countries and China is almost disappearing now, because Chinese wages are rising so rapidly. 
Um, and now China will have to have a higher wage economy, but that re has different requirements. That means they need to have more investment in human capital, more transparent and efficient capital markets, something that's difficult to do and that they don't have right now. So this is one of the challenges they face. Another challenge they face is that they spend too much investing rather than consuming. Half of China's economy is investment in fixed assets, like shopping centers, office buildings, apartment complexes. That's half of their output. That's only 25, uh, 20 percent of our output. So that's an abnormal and unsustainable level. It means that it's politically driven. It doesn't make economic sense. A lot of the bank loans to finance that investment will go bad, and China's state-run banks will eventually have to be bailed out by their government, and that will lead to a slowdown economic growth. But the main thing is that that investment is not contributing to the standard of living in China or the ability to produce more. Just one example is this picture here. This is the inside of the South China Mall in Dongguan in southern China. It's the largest mall in the world. To put it in perspective, the biggest mall here in the US is the Mall of America in Minneapolis. It has 2.1 million square feet of retail selling space. The South China Mall has 7 million square feet of selling space, and it's 98% vacant. And it's been open for six or seven years now. So this is just one of many examples of wasted space, wasted investment, uh, that doesn't make any economic sense, doesn't add anything to China. The Chinese leadership is aware of the problem, and they recognize that they have to move more toward a consumer-driven economy. But the reforms needed to do that are difficult politically, and so it's uncertain whether they're going to move rapidly enough in that direction. So they need consumer-led growth. What does that require? It requires higher wages, which we're seeing, and that's a good thing. It requires a better social safety net so that consumers don't save as much as they do, and we're not quite there yet. It requires a stronger currency to make imports cheaper. They're moving in that direction. It requires lower profits for state-owned enterprises, or SOEs, because their profits are a huge share of GDP, because they're protected from competition, and then those profits are reinvested in wasteful investments. So if they could get those profits down by creating more competition for them and privatizing more of them, that could help lead to a more consumer-driven economy. And higher interest rates also would mean less useless investment and better return on the consumer savings. Another long-term challenge that's a very big issue for China is income inequality. Uh, it's a huge problem. It's growing. It creates all sorts of social tensions. And there are now discussions among the leadership to try to do something about it. Uh, one of the things they want to do is to end the hukou system, which is a system of residence permits which affects what kind of government benefits you get. Imagine if in this country, if you came from Mississippi, a poor state, and moved to Connecticut, a rich state, but you had a residence permit that said you're from Mississippi, and therefore, even if you lived in Connecticut, you couldn't send your children to public schools in Connecticut, you couldn't get other benefits of living in Connecticut, you couldn't get a mortgage in Connecticut because you're from Mississippi. That's sort of the system that exists now in China. And that's creating a two-class system. And that's one of the things they need to change. They, they want to raise their minimum wage, again, lower the profits of state-owned enterprises, and spend more money on social benefits. Again, all politically difficult things to do. And finally, what are the influences on China's consumer market? Uh, well, one positive influence is the rise in wages. Um, there is the shift to a higher skilled workforce that refle is reflected in those higher wages. We're seeing more investment, including retail investment, in the second tier cities that are growing faster. The Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou's of the world, those are now slowing down. More of the investment is taking place in the interior of the country. There is the continued income disparity, which obviously has a big impact on the consumer market there. Uh, but as I said, there are some new efforts at reform. And let me finally turn to Japan, uh, which is really interesting because they're about to undergo a big change. The situation until now has been pretty bleak. They've had 20 years of very slow economic growth and continuing deflation, that is, declining prices. And that discourages people from spending money, uh, and it has a very negative impact on economic growth. They've had some stimulus from their central bank, which hasn't been very effective. They have very weak export demand because their currency has been overvalued and because the global economy has been weak. 
They have declining competitiveness because countries like Korea and China are becoming far more competitive in the, in the kinds of products that the Japanese sell. And there's very weak consumer demand in Japan. So it's been a very bad situation until now. And now they have a new prime minister, Shinzo Abe, uh, who was promising to do some very radical things, including a massive fiscal stimulus to try to boost economic growth. He's put in place a new leadership at the Bank of Japan, which has said they will engage in a very aggressive monetary policy until they end deflation and create some inflation. And he promises that he'll engage in negotiations for the TPP, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The goal is free trade in the Pacific region, mainly free trade between Japan and the US. And that would require Japan to engage in market opening economic reforms, including liberalizing their retail market. So all of these things would be good, would contribute to strong economic growth. The anticipation of these policies has already led to a big increase in equity prices. Since October, equity prices in Japan are up 40%. I wish I had bought Japanese stocks back in October, if I had, if I had had an inkling of this. Um, and the yen has fallen substantially, um, which will be very positive for the competitiveness of Japanese exports. So I think Japan could go from being a moribund country to being a country with reasonably good economic growth in the years to come. So those are my thoughts on a couple of places in the world. And um, I'm happy to take your questions now. Thank you. OK, I guess there are people with microphones, so I'll wait to hear a question. In your talk about the US economy, you kept talking about the long-term unemployment problem, and particularly the problem with the non-skilled workers. What is your view on the alternate problem that we have of the degradation of our roads and our transportation systems and the things that made this country great to begin with? Do you think that there should be some sort of government works program or something that could employ those people and cause you know, more money being into the economy, and would that offset the cost to the government? Well, um, yeah, I, I think the degradation of our public infrastructure is a serious problem, and it would make sense to invest more in it. And we invest a smaller share of our GDP in public infrastructure today than we did in the past. It reflects the fact that with our aging population, so much of our government spending is going to supporting the elderly. It's not a bad thing, it's just that we've had this huge shift in government spending toward that. It's politically difficult to cut it, so we've cut other things, including spending on public infrastructure. I think a better solution, longer term, would be to say let's somehow cut the growth of those entitlement programs and maybe raise taxes a bit too and spend more on public infrastructure, which historically has had a positive impact on the efficiency of the economy. So it is a problem. Um, I'm not sure that spending on infrastructure is a solution to long-term unemployment. I think a better solution to that would be more investment in human capital uh, rather than just investment in, in infrastructure. But this is certainly a very big issue. Other questions? I hey, Ira. See. Yeah. Uh, Tom Red. Um, let's say hypothetically that I was young, like these kids in back, they're going to be graduating and looking into the retail industry. So I'm headed off to New York or some city or something like that. What are the three things about retail and economics that I kind of need to get in my head to think about as my role as a buyer or a merchant or a store involvement? What do I need to think about in economics and kind of keep in my brain all the time as a new person in retail? Well, one thing I'd say is that back in the past decade, when we had very rapid growth of consumer spending on the back of consumer debt, uh, a lot of retailers did reasonably well and patted themselves on the back. I'm doing great. But part of their, that greatness had to do with the strength of the consumer part of the economy. And that's not likely to come back soon. So going forward, retailers that do really well will do really well because they're great retailers, because it will be more of a market share battle. I think that's something retailers need to understand that it's going to be a more challenging environment going forward, but there's still great opportunities. And I guess another thing they need to know is that the world has changed irrevocably uh, because of technology. Terry talked a lot about technology and 
huge impact it's having. I mean, I, I watch my, my daughters, they don't watch television anymore. Uh, they're just sitting on their mobile devices interacting with each other even when they're in the same room, not even talking to each other. <laughs> and, and then getting on Facebook and telling the world what they did that day. I don't really get it, but I mean, you have to get it if you're going to succeed in retail because this is the world we live in and technology is going to be very important from a consumer pr perspective, not just simply the perspective of managing a business and managing inventory. So I guess those are the, you wanted three lessons, I can only think of two right now, but those would be the two that I would, would say to somebody entering the field. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Uh, can you touch on uh, what you believe are the pros and cons of the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership? Um, you know, we don't hear too much of it in the U.S. media, and I'm just interested uh, to know what you think about it. Yeah, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is an effort to negotiate freer trade among the Pacific nations. It would be the U.S., Canada, Mexico, Japan, China, Korea, and so on. Um, and this is a long-term undertaking. It's not going to happen overnight. But freer trade is, on balance, a good thing. It leads to faster economic growth, leads to lower prices for consumers, leads to more efficient production and allocation of resources. So in the very long term, uh, I think it would be a good thing, but we're talking very long term in terms of anything actually happening and being implemented. Um, and that is probably one of the reasons we're not hearing a lot about it in the media, because it's not very immediate. It's something that, that will happen five or 10 years out. Time's up, okay. Well, thanks very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the conference.